Uh, it's my uh, privilege and honor to introduce two gentlemen from Homeland Security. Uh, first, we have uh, Rob Karras. Rob is the director of the National Cybersecurity Assessments and Technical Services, NCATS, depart, uh, at DHS. Uh, in his current role as director, he manages the NCATS team and provides cybersecurity services to federal agencies, state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. He is responsible for creating and identifying new services and developing the NCATS program into the civilian government's uh, leading services, uh, security services provider. Prior to joining DHS, he worked in the private sector for 12 years developing security operations. We also have Jason Hill, who's the red team lead at DHS, also at NCATS. Uh, so Jason joined uh, DHS in 2013 to help create the nation's uh, red team. Uh, he has 24 years of information security field uh, experience and 22 years in the Army National Guard within the uh, cybersecurity domain. He serves as the Deputy Chief of the National Cybersecurity Assessments, and once again, NCATS, uh, Risk Evaluation Team, and as the Chief of the Red Team conducting Red Team Assessments for the federal government customers. Prior to Homeland Security, uh, he served as the Red Team Instructor to military and federal government employees. I think I've probably said enough, so with that, Rob? All right, well, yeah, thanks for uh, being here. Yeah. Oh. Here you go. All right. Well, thanks for having us here, and uh, thanks for showing up. This is uh, my 12th or 13th year here. I don't know, uh, but it reminds me of uh, one of my first years when we used to sit at the on the floor back at the Alexic Park, and uh, we used to drink, and it was nice and informal and casual. So uh, I'm going to give you a over overview of, of what NCATS is, uh, the services that we do. Jason's going to go down and do a, a technical dive into it, and then I'm going to give you guys some uh, election results uh, that we've found from uh, the customers. So what do we do at NCATS? Um, we do assessments, and what are assessments? Uh, cyber assessments, we have three main main uh, programs under, under my uh, NCATS. First is called cyber hygiene, and that you could think of it as uh, scanning devices on the internet. So uh, departments, agencies come to us. Um, we have three main, actually, let me go back. We have three main uh, constituents. We have the federal government that we uh, work with. We have state and local governments, which um, uh, are so many. And then we have private sector. So uh, elections fall under either state and local or private sector. So, uh, and then um, cyber hygiene is, is a vulnerability scanning. Uh, on, on the internet. So we have right now 835 customers that we uh, persistently scan. So if we find a vulnerability on, on a customer, we're going back and scanning that uh, machine daily to see what closure rate is. So we believe in not just identifying the vulnerability, but then identifying what a customer does with, the, with that vulnerability and with that notification. So it does me no good to find a vulnerability and say, hey, your window's open and for you never to shut it. So I tell you your window's open, how long does it take you to shut the window? Does it take you a day, an hour, uh, five days? We had a huge problem in the federal government where it was taking over 300 days for people to close critical vulnerabilities. Uh, we issued what's called a binding operational directive and now the closure rate on the critical vulnerabilities is about approximately uh, 12 and a half days. So that's a big win. Um, we want to do that with state and local and the private sector, but we don't have the authority, right? We, we, can, we can push them, we can nudge them, we can say, uh, stomp up and down and say, you know, this is an issue, um, but we don't have the authority. We have the authority over on the on the uh, federal side because we're federal government. Um, the risk and vulnerability side is basically uh, we have a risk evaluation program, and there's three services under there. And Jason will go deeper into these, but I'll give you guys a high, higher level. So we have the uh, risk and vulnerability assessment, which is a two-week pen test, basically. Uh, any of those three constituents, federal government, state and local government, or private sector, can come to us and, and uh, ask requests for one. We'll give them a week where we try to break in from the outside, and then we'll go a week onside and act as trusted insiders or, or insiders and try to break in, into their systems. Um, under that, we also have a true red team capability, which Jason's built out. Uh, he could go into that a little bit, but that's, that's more um, on the federal, federal side that we offer it. And then we have a remote pen test capability where we just test from the outside. Um, the third program that we have is operational assurance. And that's kind of more like the, the, the if you think of a blue team and stuff, they're, they're out asking questions, going out and, and getting surveys um, and uh, providing guidance based on that. You know, do you guys have an incident response plan and going through that? They do a validated architecture design review where they 
um, get PCAP data, and then they look at your architecture and, and look at it and say, oh, well, you have a firewall here, and I have PCAP data. Why is data flowing from your financial uh, portion of your company over to this other portion. And so they work with that. Uh, under that, we just built out, and this is election focused, but it's, it's going to be all control system focused, uh, applied vulnerability assessments or, or AVA. And that's where vendors can come to us and give us their election systems or, or control system, and we'll set it up and we'll uh, follow their uh, documentation for setting up as, as a standard setup, and then look at it and try to tear it apart and to try to red team it and, and test it and see what we can do. We'll take the firmware off and see if there's any, any issues in the firmware and then any other issues inside the system. So um, on cyber hygiene, we have 595 customers. Oh, one thing I didn't talk about was uh, why we do this and, and the legal documentation that goes along with this. Everything we do has legal documentation. So we're just not going out there and scanning uh, for, for the heck of it. So there's 830 customers they've signed and, and agreed for us uh, to, to scan them. Um, and why we do it and, and what we get from it is, is invaluable, right? So we have a consistent data set on this so we can see trends. So we can see trends whether it's in the financial section, it's the election sector, uh, or whatever sector it is. Jason, you want to go into uh, detail what a risk and vulnerability assessment is? Can you guys hear me OK? Because yeah, I usually don't use microphones. But um, one of the things that Rob didn't say about those services is that they're all voluntary. So <clears throat> we don't show up to, to people's doors and say, hey, we're doing this kind of thing. But uh, I think that's kind of important to put out. But but to go along with the, the RVA service that we provide, it's a two-week penetration test, right? Who are my pen testers in here besides the guys that work for us? Um, uh, so a penetration test, uh, we're going to try to show the, the customer everything we can find um, from a vulnerability standpoint um, within the time frame that we have, right? So. Um, traditionally, a penetration test is um, we're running scanners, I'm running Nmap, I'm trying to find all the IPs I can find in the given scope that they've given me. Um, I'm trying to run a vulnerability scanner against those IPs to try and find those, that low-hanging fruit, the, the, the things that Nessus or uh, Nexpos is going to tell me that's there. Um, and then once I have that information, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to validate any of those vulnerabilities, right? And then after that, uh, if there's any web applications, we're going to throw some scanners at them. And if there's any databases, we're going to throw some scanners at them, right? So what, how does that differentiate us from a normal traditional penetration test? Um, that stuff is all great. Uh, it's, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit traditional. Sometimes it's a little bit boring to just kick off a scanner and let it run. Um, so, so we add a little bit of value to that for our customers. So we, we, do, we do do all of that, right? Uh, and then we validate everything. But then we take it to the next level. We try to give our customers um, what it looks like to be to be hacked essentially right what it looks like to be attacked um, I can give those results of the scanners to to the customers and 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 tell them hey you just had a penetration test here you go good luck and, and leave uh, but that doesn't really mean anything if I'm if I'm telling the the CIO or the CSO or or some official that hey your Nessa scanner came back with 13 criticals and you've got to clean that up that's not really helping right and so um, we take it the next step and, and, and we try to emulate some sort of an adversary. So what we'll do is, um, once we get all those results from our scanners, we'll try to hit the low-hanging fruit, but, but really what we're doing is trying to get a foothold somewhere. It's really distracting. Um, try to get a foothold somewhere within that network, whether it's through phishing, um, whether it's through an external uh, misconfiguration or an exploitation or a, a, a vulnerability that we can throw an exploit at. Uh, we try to gain a foothold. We try to um, privilege escalate, uh, laterally move throughout the network, try to get domain administrator in their network, move around and find what we call sensitive business systems, right? So uh, when we're all done, if I go to, uh, if I go to the, the, the president of the, the credit union or the president of the water company or the electric company, I tell them, hey, um, I got domain administrator in your network. A lot of you guys in here knows what that means, right? Like, that's bad. Uh, but when we tell them, they're like, I don't, I don't know what that is. That's not really helping me. So we try to go after what we would think to them as a sensitive business system, something that's going to either have them explaining what happened to either Congress or explaining uh, what happened in front of, of, of cameras or explaining what, to, uh, what happened to them to their shareholders. Those are the kinds of things that we're going after, whether that's PII or, or uh, proprietary information in their network. Once we find that stuff, when we outbrief them, we, we explain to them exactly what we did. Uh, to our technical guys that are, that are our customers, we say, hey, this is exactly what we did from, from, 
from gaining a foothold to privilege escalation to lateral movement. We did all of these things and this is exactly how we did them. Uh, and here's our write up on that. And here's how you clean all of that up. To our executive level folks, our C level folks, we explained to them, it doesn't matter what I did, I got in. I gave all that stuff to your technical folks. They're gonna go off and fix it. But this is the ramifications of what just happened to you. For the last two weeks, we've been inside of your network. I got access to your, your crown jewels and I was able to look at all that stuff or essentially exfil it out um, and take it. And, and I don't know what that means to you, but I'm trying to show what that means to you. So that's essentially what our RVA service is. I'm not sure if I missed anything. But. No. And, and yeah, and um, one of the things that they do is, is when they do exfil the data, they, they test various ways, right? So we just don't exfil it one way. So they'll try it over DNS, they'll try it over HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, and they'll give them a list and say, hey, you guys are good here, you guys are good here, but you're not good here. So um, what statistics and, and what can we, we learn from that? So um, there's, uh, I, I mentioned that we have 800 and something customers uh, under cyber hygiene. Of those, 98 are actually election officials or election related. So um, what data can we conclude and, and look at it with, with 98 uh, customers? Um, a, a lot. So a, a lot of the vulnerabilities that we see on, on cyber hygiene are actually the four out of, four out of the five, top five uh, vulnerabilities are the same from our broad base 800 customers to the, to the 98 customers. So uh, election officials or election uh, Networks are basically look like regular business networks. So, so there's nothing really, really daunting there. But uh, if you guys want the, the top five vulnerabilities that we, we know of there, I have to get my glasses on. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years ago, I didn't. Um, so, IIS 6.0 is unsupported. PHP is unsupported. Uh, or they're running a PHP unsupported version. Um, we detected a Unix operating system that's un, unsupported. There was a MS15034 vulnerability in HTTP. So what does that mean? So um, it's a denial of service on a, on a web server, right? So yeah, they, we're, we're seeing that. That's one of our top five, not only in the election, but uh, among all of our customers. So it's easy. Um, I don't know if you guys use Metasploit or, or a tool, but I mean, it, it's really to, easy to denial of service uh, these machines. Uh, most of them are probably default IIS servers, or, um, but we, we don't dig into it. We just, uh, cyber hygiene just strictly runs vulnerability scanners and, and finds the statistics. But the one, one the, the top five that's not in there, um, uh, that separates uh, elections from the others is uh, Microsoft Exchange Server is an unsupported version. Still an unsupported version, but we're seeing all these unsupported versions under there. So we're trying to work with them, trying to work with them and, and get them to, yeah, and, and, and it goes back. I mean, uh, I don't know if you guys were just in, in this last talk, but, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, a lot of money just came down to the, to the states and the uh, local communities. I don't remember what the gentleman said, but it was about $350 million or, or, or so, you know. So, um, and then he talked about resources, not having the resources to do it. So you, what he says, our data backs up, right? So there's unsupported devices that aren't, people aren't fixing or, 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 or updating. And this just gives an attacker a vector either to, to cause havoc or, or cause doubt in people's mind. You know, So, okay, you denial of service and machine doesn't really affect anything, but it, it makes people think and wonder, well, if they could do that, what else can they do? Let's see. Um, on the risk and vulnerability assessments, so we've done 30 of these on election related officials and we've done them from small counties to hugest cities in America to states and actually to a couple private private sector uh, people and the results are, are pretty similar to uh, what we're finding on 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 the uh, red team side Do you want to walk them through the the number one way we get in so through through a phishing and then sure. escalate escalate sure. to I, we, we can't talk about customers, so um, goes back to, yeah, 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 <laughs> and, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty good odds, um, but the important thing is, you know, well, we do sign uh, legal agreements, um, and we do put out, and we're, we're going to work on putting out, like, non-attributable statistics uh, based on this and, and reports, so you, you can see um, what we're talking about, and we have some past uh, reports they're not election specific but but they're overall but the trends just the the, the important thing is and and I'm, I'm gonna save it to the end and 
um, Jason's going to chug his uh, fireball there when, when I when I talk about it. But um, there, there's there's one one difference um, be, between elections and and everybody else. But uh, we'll, we'll get that. We, we don't want to spoil it right now. So talk about fishing and, and get there. How we get it. Uh, so all of you in the room help us out every time we send a, f a phishing email. Um, uh, so so I'm, I'm sure all of you in here know or are familiar with phishing. Uh, and it's pretty much our number way, one way of getting in. Um, so throughout all of our assessments that Rob spoke about, the RVAs, the red team portion, the, the, the RPTs, the remote pen testing, um, there's a common theme and that's phishing. Um, some of our assessments, we will work with our customers and, and come up with a, a common theme or an email to, to break in and we'll count up all the people who, who clicked on it or opened it and gave us comms back and then we'll give them those stats. Um, in one of our services, um, we, work, we work closely with, uh, with, the, with the customers in a manner that we try to build a rapport with them, right? So uh, I'm going to send an email out to, to a customer. I'm going to do some open source research on them and, and find out that they're supposed to interact with the, with the public, right? And they have some sort of public relations duty. They're expecting forms. They're expecting documents. Um, so we're going to work with them. We're going to talk to them and say, hey, you know, I saw you're the, you're, you're the point of contact for this. Uh, can you help me out? I've got this document. I've got some questions on. And we don't send them anything. We're just, we're just sending them this initial email so they'll, they'll do their job, right? That's what we're expecting them to do. They'll respond back to this with, yeah, sure, send it over. Uh, we send over a document. Um, and, and for us, it's our document is our payload. It's our way back. It's our comms. It's our C2 channel. Um, and we do that for one of two reasons. One, um, if we never hear back from them, something caught it and ate it, right? Or they left, or they're, they're on vacation or something. But um, uh, So if we never hear back from them, either something went wrong at the user level or something went wrong at the network level, the security level uh, 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 for the email. Um, and then we'll, we can send another email. Hey, did you ever get my document? Yeah, they'll either tell us yes or no, and then we know where the issues are in that chain. Uh, once we figure it out and they're like, yeah, I got your document, I clicked on it, but nothing happened because that's, that's exactly what we want it to do is nothing to happen. Um, and then uh, uh, once they write back to us and say, hey, nothing happened and we have our communication channel, then we'll turn around and close that loop and we'll actually send them the doc they were waiting on. Uh, and then we do that for, for one of two reasons. One, it makes them less suspicious, right? So if I give them what they're actually asking for, they, they feel good, they did their job, everything's great, we have our communications channel, uh, we keep it moving, they keep it moving, they did a job well done. Uh, but two, in case we get burned out of there, um, um, that is a point of contact that we can use in the future. Hey, John, or hey, Sally, uh, remember me? I've got another document, can you help me out? And, and they will tend to help us out uh, in that manner. Um, but honestly, sometimes we have customers that get wrapped around the axle on who, who clicks on the emails and how many emails were clicked on. And I, and I try to tell folks, Long gone are the days of stopping people at the param at the perimeter, right? So, so we've kind of got that mm, pretty close to shored up. Um, right now, it's more of how do we stop? How do we identify that there's someone there, and how do we slow them down long enough to catch them and do something about it? So, so we try not to have people harp on who clicked on their email. So that's about email. Yep. So, so our number one vector, whether it's non-election or it's election is, is phishing getting getting in in through phishing um we don't have uh detailed uh stats we we have a fit actually I, I totally bypassed it i don't know why we have a whole phishing campaign assessment that people can can sign up for um we just rolled it out to the election uh officials uh, a few months ago so we don't have too too many too much stats on it but i, I will tell you um I believe that they're going to be in line with, with our overall stats, and, and this is mind-boggling. So by the time Jason sends out an email or, or somebody on the team send, sends out an email, it takes 13 minutes for somebody to click on it. So that's, that's our first presence. So, you know, Jason sends it at 1, 113 on average. He, he gets a, a reply in, in, uh, and on. So, but for that person to uh, respond to the SOC, anybody want to take a guess on how long it takes them? Three hours. Three hours. So yeah, thirty days, three hours. But by the the amount of damage that Jason can do in that in that three hours is is significant and, and, and amazing. So he could pivot to other other computers, get domain admin, get uh, enterprise admin, exfil the data, and be gone in sixty minutes. Gone in sixty minutes. 
Well, I think 60 our, seconds? Yeah, I, I think our last assessment was 42 minutes from the time we sent the email to the time we had DA the entire network. 42 yeah. minutes. So, so, thanks to the DA. Right. So, our, 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 using these data driven stats, we're, we need to educate the users to, to report it, right? If you see something, say something. It's a DHS slogan, so we'll carry it on to, to, to them. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it, it's, it's all seriousness. And, and, I mean, it's not to be ashamed to, to click on an email, I mean, or, or phishing. I mean, it, it's going to happen, or it, you're just not sure. Um, yeah, I've done it. Um, I've been caught by a skimmer at a 7-Eleven before, so dummy me. But, you know, it happens. I mean, you know, I've been in security for 25 years. So, um, you, but, you, you know, you do something, you take remediation actions, and, and you take care of it. So the other, um, so the top, top two uh, in the risk and vulnerability uh, assessment deal with phishing. The uh, next three uh, issues that um, are consistent across uh, non-election and election are our patch management. We have an is issue with that. Uh, once, once we're on site, we see that there, there's issue with patching. Um, ad admin password reuse. So if we see uh, admin password somewhere, we're going to see it somewhere else, whether it, it's on from a local machine to a database to, to somewhere else. You want to talk about any examples on that? Sure, yeah. So uh, so there's this thing in, in the working world where people have to work, right? Uh, so <laughs> sometimes security gets in the way, right? It's, um, it's, um, there's this scale of usability versus security, right? So uh, I've been an admin before. I've been a domain admin before, and I've had people come to me and like, I need this to work, and... I don't really care about that security part. And then when the boss comes, the CEO or the general comes and says, yeah, I don't care about that either. Make it work. And you, and you have to make things work. You run into stuff like uh, admin password reuse, where, where I'm sure if any of you guys here are in IT and any of you are admins, you know that you're not supposed to use your admin account as your daily account. You're not supposed to check email under that account. You're not supposed to do normal day-to-day -day routines under that account. But when someone needs a password change, you're supposed to log out of that, log back into your other guy, and then and then do those things. Well, some people, I, I don't want to use the word lazy, but um, automated or, or um, efficient. They want to be efficient. So they'll, they tend to use that same username and password to do all of the things that they're, they're not really supposed to be doing. So we run into that uh, quite a bit. And then the final, final, yeah, a lot of people do it. So and the final thing is insecure default configurations. So we're, we're seeing that just everywhere. I mean, it's, it's, it's not an election issue. It's not a non-election issue. It's just a person, people issue. That's 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 what our data is driving us to. So I think one of the good things is, um, if if there is a good thing, you know, uh, uh, elections have have uh, heightened the uh, alert and the uh, knowledge in in the um, general populace that there are security issues and people are taking it more serious. So the the you know, it sucks that, you know, it has to come to this, but uh, people aren't going to change until it directly affects them. And now it's affecting the, the election com, com, uh, community, which directly affects, you know, America, the population. So um, if that's what it takes, unfortunately, to, to change, I think um, on one hand, it's a good thing. On, on second hand, I don't think it's a good thing, but we've been preaching a lot of the same things in, in the security community for the past 20, 30 years. I, I'm sure I could pull out one of my speeches that I did in the 90s and give it here and it'd still be relevant, you know, change your password and do this. But um, we just got to hammer it, hammer it down and, and get people to really take this, these things serious and, and actually get them the resources so that they can handle this and they can, they can do it. So, I mean, if, if you have a list of 50 things to do and each thing takes 70 hours, how many things are you going to do in a year? You're, you're not going to accomplish much. So... Um, all right, so our top observations, and I'll, I'll, I'll work, work bas uh, backwards uh, to, to the top one, um, poor password usage. So we're seeing uh, default passwords everywhere. We're seeing weak passwords everywhere. So, um, clear text passwords. Yeah. Uh, documents full of clear text passwords. Yeah. It's 2018, and we find those everywhere. Yeah. And I have one, right? <laughs> so, yeah. It's really bad. And when he, someone's document literally says passwords. Yeah, and he'll see it right on the desktop, and they'll yeah. they'll take a screenshot of it, and it'll be a spreadsheet or something, and just say passwords. You open it up, and there it is. So no no uh, gate, uh, key, key, gatekeeper or any any pass. key pass or whatever. It's just flat text file. And that so, password to key pass is usually written down somewhere too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> All right. Um, here it is, the top observation. So 
Um, the main difference, though, so everything that we've talked about has been consistent between election uh, systems and, and non-election systems. The one thing that we've been noticing, and this is on the, on the cyber hygiene side, is the, the time to mitigate. So we've been scanning these uh, 98, well, so we're, we're scanning 98 election officials, and, and some have come on like two years ago, three years ago. Some have come on as, as recently as uh, a month ago. Um, but the time to mitigate. So I see vulnerabilities in these systems for hundreds of days. Um, I don't mind the low ones. I don't mind the informational ones. Fine, it's informational. But I'm seeing high and critical ones, and they're just not getting they're not getting fixed as, as rapidly as as the ones that are in in the financial community, in, in the water community, and in other communities. So when I when I line all all the communities up, um, election. Uh, the election community ranks last in time to mitigate. So if that's one thing that I, I can say and I can emphasize for, for uh, the state and local and these private sector companies to do is um, really uh, put in some kind of a process and, and procedure to fix these. And, and we're not talking, um, it, most, most of them are, are easy fixes. It's just getting the resources and getting the processes in, in place. So we did it in the federal government. Um, uh, Assistant Secretary Moffer was here earlier and talked about how there's 99 agencies um, and they're huge. Some agencies are huge. Some have four or five people. But we got and we changed their culture, right, to get on these and, and change the uh, or patch the criticals within 30 days. So we want to get the word out to the elect well, to all the communities, but um, uh, especially the election community because we're here to actually patch patch those vulnerabilities. So um, we're sending out reports. Um, one thing I didn't mention, how cyber hygiene works and, and from a high level, so conceptually so you guys can see it. So we scan a, we scan a machine or we scan a, scan a network and we find a uh, device that's, that's vulnerable. We'll scan the, the critical uh, and the machine has a critical vulnerability on it. We'll scan that uh, machine twice a day to see if anybody's closed it. If it has a high vulnerability, we'll scan it once a day. If it has a medium, we'll scan it twice a week. And a low vulnerability, we'll scan it once, once a week. So... Um, we're really trying to track closure rate, and, and we feel that as if we can really push and push uh, the people to, to close the vulnerabilities, it, it's, it's a big win for us. So uh, with that said, uh, you got anything else? We'll open it up to questions. Great. Um, so the I'll take the, uh, a moment of privilege here to ask a, a two-part question to begin with. Uh, uh, now, that's right. I'll be very loud. How's that? Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, okay. So... When you work on election systems, uh, are you right now doing any pen testing of machines, or is it all the uh, networks for the election providers? So I mentioned that. Can you guys hear me about that? For the camera. Oh, for the camera. For the camera. For you guys. You good? All right. Um, so I did mention we have this uh, applied vulnerability assessment uh, program that we're just standing up. So. Um, we do have uh, um, one uh, election system up in house, okay. and uh, we just uh, we we um, uh, a company actually donated it to us and said, "Hey, we want you." And we're getting more and more uh, election companies coming to us and and saying, "Yeah, DHS, help us identify some vulnerabilities, make us make us better, make us make us stronger." So right now, um, we're getting through the the first pilot, um, and uh, we we have it set up, and we're going to take. The firmware part, and, and we're going to diagnose it and and do a do a nice write up on it. We have several other vendors wanting to to do it, so and we're building up the resources to to be able to do that. So it, it's something that we're going to build up uh, later this year, in the next year, and before the 2020 election. Excellent. Now that answers my second question. Okay. Is there, yeah. so the Yeah, yeah, published. it's published. Well, and I don't know how many times Jason Jason will t call me, um, and uh, he he really hasn't done it from the election side, but he's he's done it from the banking side, and he's like, Rob, I'm sitting here 
with the CISO. I'm like, oh, really? I didn't know they had a CISO. He's like, well, he's really what, their loan officer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's their loan officer. So um, we're, we're seeing that in, in the smaller smaller communities, too, in the election, election uh, facilities. The bigger comp, uh, counties like Cook County and, and L.A., uh, they, they have a little bit more resources. But it, it, it's a tough battle. Um, you know, they, they just tell people, go get this cert, and then they, they do their day job, and their day job isn't anything to do with security. Um, you know, uh, I think as, as time goes on, that'll change, but we're, we're not there yet. I just like to add on to that real quick. So, so Rob mentioned the, the small banks where the guys, the VP plus the IT guy, right? So, so those things are double-edged swords. Those guys, like you mentioned, they don't they don't really have a handle on security. However, what I'm finding is is that the the smaller organizations that we go to, um, the last one I was at was 70 people strong uh, elections place. And um, everything that we found as we were going along, they were able to mitigate, fix, block, and we retested before we left. So that's a little bit of the beauty of the smaller organizations as opposed to the big ones. I was at a Fortune really high number, and uh, their, their CISO was on the phone with me, and he's asking me, Jason, how do I... St-? They had a local admin problem, 45%. And this is after... 45% of their, their workforce still had local admin on their machines. And this is after they had this... Uh, this campaign to get that reduced from 100%. And, and trust me when I say they were global. Um, and so he asked me, how, how, do you, how do we fix this? How do, I, how do I get people to not be local admins? And I looked at him and said, you're the CISO. I, I would write a policy and tell them to stop doing it and then turn it off. I, I don't know, you know how to, to do it. And, I, and so the point to that is... <laughs> Other than a joke, the point of that is is that the smaller organizations, even though they don't have a well honed um, security force or, or or folks there to help them along or or to be proactive, when they do find a problem, when they do find an issue, it's usually mitigated before we leave. The bigger organizations, excuse me, the bigger organizations, we'll go back to um, year after year and we'll find some of the same holes that were there the year past. Which just means that that four hours that it took to to breach the network and take over now is down to two hours or one hour because we have all the information from the last time. So, yes. Twenty sixteen voter registration system correct? But I feel like what? I gotta make a phone call. Sorry. Yeah, so that's that's uh, Intel, and that's a different division. But as far as I know, I, I haven't seen any reports where anything was altered. So, and actually, physically access breach. Like, yeah, I haven't seen any of that. So, so, um, yeah. Guys, give us any more details about that besides just like the vague Senate Intel committee stuff. It would all be made up. We don't work in that. Right. We don't work in that arena. I mean, so, I mean, you can ask this gentleman right here. You the same. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I mean, so what we do is, uh, I mean, we do assessments, right? And and I could talk about all my data and and all the data that we do and all. Oh, I guess one of the first things I should have said, all of our stuff that we do is unclassified. So, <laughs> you know, um, we do have clearances, but uh, the guys that we bring on don't have clearances, and and the customers that we don't do because when we're going to state and local governments and private sectors, they don't have clearances. So one of the first things uh, when I came um, and started this in 2010, I I said it's it's going to be unclassified everything that we do, and since 2010, since day one, it's it's been unclassified. So um, dealing in that arena, we don't have any any idea. But just think, Jason's successful. 99%, 96.3% of the time it, just with using open source and uh, unclassified tools and, and his knowledge and, and knowing what he, he does. He, they get stuck every once in a while, but then they, they write some scripts and, and uh, do some coding to, to do some evasive maneuvers over antivirus and, and other stuff. But everything we do is on, on the unclass. So um, as far as the classified stuff, I couldn't yeah, tell you. So. I'm wondering how you guys define the, uh, the scope of your issues, so the 10th S7 writing assessments. Uh, is it the 
onus on the customer or the election office to actually say you're looking at these IPs or you're looking at these networks, or are you working with them to actually? Yeah. So figure so. That out? Yeah, so two ways. On the cyber hygiene side, um, they, they define it. They, we, we have a form that they fill out, and they say these are our public IPs, and this is what you're allowed to scan. Um, if they have a third-party uh, vendor uh, that they use, they have to get an agreement with them, and then they provide us the IPs, but it, they, they provide us the targets and the scopes. And on the RVA side, we have like a pre-assessment questionnaire that we go through, and I'll let Jason talk about that. Uh, just one thing I wanted to point out uh, is, again, the service is voluntary. So uh, if, if an organization comes to us and they, they give us the scope and it's pretty locked down, I mean, uh, we'll ask for more if we can. Uh, if it helps do what, what we think they need to, to look at, um, we will. But ultimately, the customer has the final say in that. Um, we work real close with our, our points, we call them POCs, our points of contact or our trusted agents on... Uh, the scope that they give us, the amount of information that we get um, in our RVAs, it's a it's a um, uh, white box, I guess. So so everyone knows what's going on, and and both parties want you know, really, if we lose, they win. If we win, they win. So everybody wants to to you know, our goal is to defend the nation, right? I mean, I live here, you guys live here. Um, we want this place to be secure. I want to keep whoever wants our data and whatever they want to do with it. I, I have no idea, um, but but we want to keep it secure. So to answer your question, the, the, the scope is pretty much dictated by the customer and we'll help them along if they're, if they're kind of lost or they need our help. Uh, well, let me add one thing to that. So sometimes customers do come in with unrealistic expectations. So like DHS came to us. So we consider DHS a customer, even though we work for DHS. So they came to us and they said, well, during this two-week uh, event, we want you to test TSA. We want you to test USCIS. We want you to test CBP. We want you to test Secret Service. And they're like, wait a minute, there's only four guys. <laughs> so that's what Jason does. He, he talks to them and says, what, what's really critical? What do we want to test? So... Um, we, we set expectations. You're assuming that the customer still has a basic understanding of the risk of the network before you guys start to scan to focus on those areas. Is that, is that a correct statement? Uh, we actually, we, we work with the customer, right? So um, elections, in elections, we, we kind of know what, what's critical, and they know what's critical, right? They're, they're trying to, to save those databases full of PII, right? All, all of our data in this room, right? If you're... If you're um, Register to vote. We're trying to save that data. So for them, we 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 kind of know what it is and what what to go after. Um, really, what it comes down to is, did they give us that information to 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 get, or are they leaving it up to us to find? So yeah, and, and then in, in in other cases where the customer, like you said, that you, we're leaving it up to them to tell us what they already know or what they think they know. That's where we'll work with them and talk to them about what it is they're trying to protect, and and we kind of coach them. I mean, we've been doing this for so long that that we kind of coach them along until. You know, it's beneficial for everybody. Go ahead. So I, I, uh, I'm on Shoday. I'm a little scan. I find that the Shoday County, Texas, they're laughing at the work at Microsoft IS, IIS 2.0. Corroborating our story. Yeah. Um, That's <laughs> exactly what. So, so my, my question is uh, why? So, so we have resources, right? We have so many people that work for us. Um, the county is free to go out to Shodan and find that information. Also, um, it's free. You found it in in a matter of minutes, right? So, you know. Um, we work with willing customers, right? So if a stakeholder comes to us um, and, and says they want to sign up for our services, uh, we'll do more than just find what, what's on, the, on, on Shodan. So, um, you know, we're, we're just not resourced there to, to protect, you know, there's over, if you count cities uh, and, and uh, counties and states, I mean, there's over 10,000 different entities and we're just not resourced to do that. If DHS gives me the resources and, and the American taxpayer pays for it, I'm, I'm more than happy to build that service into mine, but that's not part of our service right now. Well, 
but it's your, your resources, right? Then we need a, a, a apparently change in federal law where if I'm coming on this county in the state of Texas with their federal change money, and there's obvious security vulnerability, you found it. So there's no resources you must be spending. You must be this county, this state, fix this. But I, I still, yeah. And then you don't fix it if you are under but that law doesn't exist yet, right? No, right, no, yeah, no, they, they, no, right. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> yeah. so before that federal candidate becomes a, you know, uh, uh, a government official, they're, they're a citizen, right? So it's the United States of America, and we're different from a lot of other countries in the world. We're not forcing the government to do something for that county, even though it makes sense. I'm not going to argue with you that it makes complete sense that we should be protecting everyone, but they have to. <laughs> but they have to request it. Yeah. Well, Write your congressman. Yeah. <laughs> Change the law. Yes. From an attacker point of view, after you get your export via you know, via phishing email, how have you exploited the organization that fully implemented the zero threat architecture? And what difficulty from an attack standpoint has it seen? Is it from a crunchy outside to the yep. side? Okay, so so uh, just real quick, I know this is a small room, but but what the gentleman is asking is if people are uh, segmenting their network properly, how has that given us trouble, right? Paraphrasing. Uh, so, so I did a critical infrastructure organization um, and they were segmented to the hilt. They segmented off their ICS portion um, through three sets of firewalls, three different segments. However, uh, in order to make things work and in order to um, have the least amount of admins throughout that network, um, the only hole they opened in the firewall was the hole to allow uh, communication between the Active Directory servers so that they could replicate, right? Uh, and so we rode those channels through three or four different security devices until we hit the, the SCADA systems. So the answer is, if it's done properly, which I'm not really sure we've seen yet, uh, let me take, let me rephrase that. Has done it properly? Yeah, well, yeah, well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> there's one that I've seen so, that turned it off. Yeah, so, so there's one that's turned it off, but actually... Um, there's one election uh, state that actually did it right. So they had, they had it segmented so much that their registration database was offline. And to update and make changes to the database, it was a manual process. It, you had to walk from one room to another. So we're trying to get them to write up some papers and share with the other states and share their best practices so, so it gets, gets there. So That was one of 50. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we uh, have time for one more question. I would ask that it's a shorter question. It's a moment of introspection before you ask it. <laughs> it's a short question. Uh, uh, the gentleman with the plus three tech uh, Hypothetically, if you encounter the network that had evidence of third party persistence, what would your actions be? Oh, that's pretty easy. We'd send him an email. No. <laughs> 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 um, so, <laughs> within within the NKIC, uh, there's several other groups. Um, <laughs> Fireball, keep it in. <laughs> there's a hunt and incident uh, response uh, team that uh, we work with uh, that is almost a sister organization to, to us. We would work with the customer and tell them of the evidence that we, we, we found or identified, and we'd ask them if they want to get our, our sister organization, the hunt and incident response team, in to come in-house and to actually identify that, and then not only find that one target, but then other, other machines that um, had indi indications of compromise on it. Okay. So... so Stop me if I yep. go too far, but um, we've actually we actually uh, have a very good example of that. We just had that happen um, two three weeks ago, right, Face? Yeah. So uh, so one of our high speed guys is here. Uh, uh, his hacker handle is Face. Um, he uh, uh, for those of you that know what the ATM a team is, um, uh, he actually ran in, into a system uh, when we got on it. There was evidence of compromise 
turns out they were still on that box, um, crypto mining, I believe. Uh, and so we, we handled that with the customer. We, we definitely have a protocol for that. We, we, everything stops, comes to a halt. We contact those folks and we put them in contact with the, with the people that uh, Rob just mentioned. Yep. And send them an email. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Do we have a round of applause?